Hello students, this is the video to go over readings for week four. Um, week four of the class, we're gonna be covering chapter two, which is on culture and cultural identity. Um, and so this topic continues some of the conversation from chapter one that we started in week one of the course. Um, it starts off by talking about beyond the binary and it looks at a social constructive constructionist lens for culture. And so in the first chapter in, in the, um, the preamble of the book, the, um, the preface of the book, it talks a little bit about how um, this textbook uses the social constructionist lens um, of culture in this entire book. And so it explains a little bit more about what this is. And so in the box in the beginning of the chapter, it says social constructionism refers to the process by which people use language or more precisely discourse to construct their lives. And so how do we use language, labels, terms? Um, how do we define those different things and, and how do we discuss them and in what spaces are we able to discuss them becomes really important. Um, and so the, the central conceptual tool is discourse. And what is discourse? What does it look like? Um, how does it sort of play out in day-to-day -day life? And so it refers to the assumptions that develop in a given cultural context to guide people's thinking and acting. And so within any society or culture or religion, um, they're gonna have sort of their own um, discourse. And in most cases, it's based on the majority culture, the majority, majority individuals within that. Um, so in the process of using it, people start to wrestle with the language that they may use. And so this sometimes is where we come to recognize that there are certain terms that have come to take on really negative connotations and therefore shouldn't be used anymore. And so maybe at one time it was okay to use those terms, but it's kind of taken on a negative connotation and so we shouldn't use it anymore. Um, in other situations, um, different groups of people may reclaim terms and make them okay to use. And so one of those examples is with the queer community that at one time, well, the word queer means different um, or, or strange, unusual. And so it was used in a negative way to identify people who we think of as being um, um, part of the LGBTQ plus community. And so over time, um, labels became less and less important for some individuals in that community. And so they went back to use the term queer based in queer theory that, you know, labels are not necessary um, or even required for many people. And so kind of using that catch-all term of, of queer. Um, the next concept that the book um, or this chapter talks about is deconstruction, which we're going to get into in the next chapter a lot. Um, but basically the the meanings of binary concepts always bound each other in relationships so like black and white are binary right and so they're bound to each other because they fall on that same line um, those binary distinctions are important because they um, become headings under which most of our thinking gets organized right it's like good bad you know whatever um normal abnormal things like that. Um, but if we open the new possibility for meaning and um, and fresh openings for living, deconstruction has been um, used to play a part in the process of addressing problems, specifically social problems or personal problems in counseling when we feel like we, we need to fall on this binary and we work in this binary system instead of really looking at different ranges and stuff. So the chapter goes on to define culture. And so, um, you know, the, the term culture can be defined in many different ways. And so you may take some time to think about what ways you've typically defined culture, and it may not be the same as some of your classmates. Um, this obviously leads to a lot of confusion, um, because if we can't have sort of an agreed upon definition of that, how do we actually discuss it? Um, so it's not uncommon that people who've had no access to formal education can be unfamiliar with the different terms that we might use um, in, in connection with culture as well. And so that, I think, further complicates um, things is if you're in, in discourse with people who might have um, 
you know, different levels of education and knowledge and experience than you do. Um, the differences in the individual thinking and addressing culture and the discourse that we have on culture um, can be very painful and lead to quite a lot of consequences um, if not addressed properly. And so misunderstandings, stereotypes, things like that. Um, and it sort of has been, I think, the way that we've looked at the multicultural or cross-cultural course in counseling over time is like let's sort of play on those stereotypes of different categories of people um, and, and use them as justifications for how we would um, work with those individuals in counseling. And um, you know, really it's not about understanding the individual as an individual and the ways that they're different identities have intersected into who they are and have played a role or not played a role, um, but kind of using stereotypes about, um, you know, cultures that they either tell us about, identities, excuse me, that they tell us about or that we make assumptions about within them. Um, and so the very concept of culture is not stable or straightforward. And so it changes and adapts over time. Um, and again, it's, it's really hard to, to pinpoint a firm definition of it. And so the study of interculture, um, interculturality is an effort to embrace diverse um, um, ideas, thoughts, beliefs, narratives, knowledge, information, practices um, that we can gain um, uh, new learnings from and, and, and um, you know, pursue um, different directions of, of how we work with others in you know, obviously we're in counseling, but also in community and in our families and, and things like that. Um, if we implement some of these strategies and use this kind of interculturality um, viewpoint in counseling, um, you know, what your textbook says is that it can help us to bridge that us and them divide that again, we talked about um, in chapter one and kind of help pull people together. Next, it goes on to discuss the context of culture. And so um, how the term being cultured or acculturation has evolved over time. And so what are some of the early definitions of culture? And then what were the labels assigned to individuals who didn't fall within that cultured definition? Um, and the ways in which majority cultures have kind of pushed for um, marginalized or um, minority cultures to be a culture, to be acculturalized, um, or to go through the process of acculturation um, into that cultured um, framework that they've created. And so um, you're again kind of seen as an us or them, either you fit within our culture and you are acculturized to our culture, or you're not, and that needs to change. And so from that standpoint, how that has really impacted the systems, the, the cultural and political systems with which we find ourselves, especially in America, a place where there is so much diversity and you know, people have come from all different places. Um, so again, kind of taking over other cultures, it's seen for their own good and um, you know, that, that there may be backwards or like wrong um, or bad in some way. And so they have to change to, to become more like what our culture dictates. Um, but if we separate ourselves from those assumptions, we will have to work to actively challenge them in ourselves and in our words and in our actions. And so how do we not only say like, okay, yeah, I, I get this and, and that makes sense, but then actually do something about it is kind of taking the next step. Um, current dominant understandings of the term culture are usually closer to scientific anthropological meanings. Um, uh, in a way, uh, the textbook identifies um, Taylor's 1871 definition, begin to articulate namely a set of attributes to a group of people. The set of attributes is considered or assumed to be stable or knowable within that group. So you can kind of identify that group by those behaviors or, or customs. Um, but culture can be taken to refer to um, a social group in terms of um, their knowledge, belief, point of views, worldview, ethic, laws, norms, morals, um, behavioral, um, uh, 
burial practices and religions, customs, behaviors, acquired habits, foods, worlds of etiquette, arts, artifacts, um, treasury creations, patterns of organization of social relationships, sexual relations, family relations, patterns of organizing, um, or excuse me, language, meaning of transmitting information, um, social groupings, institutions. And so this chapter 46 and 47 gives, you know, a list of, of many of those ways in which we can kind of identify people based on culture or consider their culture based on these different things. Um, the objective scientific perspective introduced the sense that all cultures are relative and should not be judged against external criteria, right? Because like within a specific culture and there's a lot of norms um, that may not be considered, you know, normal in others. And so we can't really hold them against one another um, because someone is always going to kind of come out as, you know, being different, um, you know, and, and there's going to be those um, sort of arguments of like, whose way is right or whose way is wrong rather than, you know, it's just different. We do things differently and that's, you know, okay. And that should be celebrated. Um, and so in a lot of ways, um, the classical anthropological studies of culture performed in the old British colonies emerge from this perspective on culture. Um, it's called the cookie cutter version of culture. And so when they did, um, you know, people studies and things like that of different places, the objective scientific method reign triumphant was able to pronounce the truth about tribal people in ways that made them seem exotic, but known, summarized and packaged in um, sort of essential truths. So these are ways that we, again, categorize these people and it's not changing and it's not evolving and it's not stable in any, or it is stable in, in every way. Um, and so, again, like I talked about, many of the multicultural trends have been um, looking from this cookie cutter perspective, um, specifically in the name of European discourses um, of progress and development of the counseling profession, rather than look at it in, you know, a, a very different um, way. Um, and so it's our interest in this textbook, in this course, um, to look at interculturality as, de, um, as a decolonial means by which cultural differences are honored and engaged for the purpose of social transformation. So again, how can we celebrate them? How can we, um, you know, um, honor them in different ways instead of kind of putting them into different boxes? So the discussion questions um, when you get into um, or before you continue into the next part of the chapter are, what examples do you notice in everyday life where people use that co cookie cutter definition of culture? And how do you, like my addition to this, how do you see, and see that play out in our society? Um, how often does this definition of culture, um, has it been featured in textbooks and teachers lectures? And so where have you seen this um, in, in your studies? Um, and how do these definitions of culture either inform or limit people's ideas about the diversity of human behavior and engagement? And so how can we use the, the um, intercultural perspective to change that, right? Um, so next, the, the chapter gets into the context of culture and modern psychology. And so it looks, at, it looks back on some of the things, um, you know, that were brought forth with Freud and Skinner and Rogers and the ways that they've all kind of looked at culture that has led us sort of to the, the point that we're at now um, with our understanding within the realm of psychology and counseling. And so how maybe their, their understandings were maybe a bit too narrow um, and really didn't look at all of the facets of, of individuals' cultures and things like that. In a more modern version, um, culture is something that we can all share, although there are hints of that, there are still hints that a civilization based on science can do better for the individual than culture can. This is what we've been calling that cookie cutter version of culture. And you know, how can we continue to um, you know, share individual cultures moving forward and make that more of the strength and the focus than, than that continued focus on the cookie cutter version. Um, culture and colonization, again, we're gonna talk a lot about colonization in the next chapter, um, but it says that the concept of culture cannot be taught as a timeless, abstract, decontextualized, apolitical or universal phenomenon, right? Because like there have been so many changes and with um, colonization, 
different cultures have come in and like wiped away, changed, impacted um, different cultures. And so without recognizing that influence and that impact, it really puts us at a deficit for really being able to fully understand these individual cultures. And so the term um, uh, colonial, colonial, it is considered a secular political and economic world system of power that remains after military colonization was discontinued and so you know military colonization happens of a place and then you know eventually either they leave or you know the the, the norms and everything are changed within that society and that impacts not only like the political and, and social structures but also economic realities and also the psychology of the individuals which again will we're going to kind of get into next um, in the next chapter. And so to study the understandings of influences and in culture in our own and other people's lives, we must wrestle with the effects of history, grieving over legacies of pain and injustice, and at the same time, identifying juxtaposed decolonial points of resistance where ruptures of this legacy have been created and sometimes celebrated. Um, and so how can those ruptures also teach us? And, and we can kind of grow from this legacy, right? And do something different. Um, next, it's the essentialist thinking about our culture. And so one particular habit of thinking that has been so strong in the cookie cutter traditions, the Europe European cookie cutter traditions of thoughts about culture um, is the habit of essentialism. And one of the purposes of this book is shedding the assumptions of essentialism thinking in order to advance intercultural practice and counseling. And so what is essentialist, essentialist thinking um, about culture? Um, it's built into the very fabric of our philosophy or philosophical history and into the academic disciplines. It's a habit of thinking in which one seeks out the true value of a concept by searching its core or central meaning. The assumption is that there's a stable, reliable core or hidden truth to be found in the meaning of words or a person's life. And that is indicative of what is true and trustworthy. Um, when we break out of essential, essentialism, we're able to recognize that there may not be one solid core truth um, or trustworthy piece that it can vary and be different um, throughout person, place, time, circumstance, all of that. Um, and so when we look at the history with the DSM and Carl Rogers self-actualization and you know, Freud's stuff. Um, there's no attempt to separate the complex contradictions of a person's life from supposed determining essences of, you know, maybe disorders um, or diagnoses. Um, neither on a person's life, or excuse me, neither is there a recognition of the diagnostic labels as culturally produced metaphors that may have an impact on the individual's life. And so in what ways might me be pathologizing an individual's culture or well-being, and then having an additional negative effect on them. They are assumed to allow us to see through the unquestioned national, natural truth about a person. The characteristics referred to by the metaphors are seen as residing within the individual in an essential or natural way. And so how can we look at um, these disorders and diagnoses as being outside of the individual? And so it's not something that's at their core that is sort of wrong or unnatural about them, but something outside of them, some kind of circumstance that they're dealing with that, that is creating this um, this difficulty that's coming from within, if that makes sense. Um, despite the familiarity of essentialist thinking, you cannot prove the existence of such essences. You can only provide an assumption that they exist. And so while we think of it as more hard science or seeking that truth, um, there isn't really anything um, that can be proven about it. And so, you know, why do we hold it up as a fact if it's not necessarily a proven or a given? Um, and so social constructionists challenge essentialism, um, the oversimplification of human beings, attitudes, feelings, and behaviors. Um, it just kind of gives it a narrow tunnel vision view on human be beings and not really more of a general perspective. Uh, 
Um, so it really promotes close identification of individuals within cultural norms and have the function of promoting the stability of cultures. They tend to emphasize cultural preservation and sometimes hold back any cultural change that could potentially happen, um, which is, I think, a lot of what we're seeing in our, in our world today, um, that there is this desire to move forward and have progression, and there's a lot of people trying to hold back the advancement of culture and falling back on you know, the way things were or those, you know, traditional values and stuff. Like how do we, you know, go back to, to when things were so great and, and, and wonderful rather than focusing on how to move towards making things even better as we, as we continue through time. Um, and so the essentialist view of culture does not accommodate intercultural differences, um, except as a diluted version of true culture. It plays down the political struggles and conflicts between groups of people who claim the same cultural membership. So again, you know, the different um, identities and individuals of people in our country get diminished, right? Like they are only a shade of, or they only should be a shade of what the like normal accepted culture is. And if you go outside of that, then you're somehow un-American, right? And so um, it just further ends up dividing um, people rather than progressing forward together. Um, a social constructionist perspective, however, asks us to always look for the social and political context by which cultural worlds get established in fluid and unstable forms. Social constructionists ask the question about how boundaries of cultural membership are policed and who gets included and excluded and makes those decisions. Um, cultural traditions and norms are not, just, are not just natural or stable givens, but have become um, emblematic of a culture through the situated decisions made by people in particular times and places. And they're always changing accordingly. Um, um, many of us are um, exposed to culturally diverse communities are quickly confronted with the immense diversity in communication styles within identifiable ethnic groups. And so again, rather than um, pinpointing or stereotyping all people that have a certain identify, identity or cultural group as having all of these same norms, recognizing that there are individual differences within all of those groups. Um, treating another culture as an object of study risks promoting the objectification of individuals who draw from that culture. Um, and it goes into discuss some of the situations in which that happened. And so while there's value in specific cultural communities gathering together and subjectively asserting some of their shared characteristics and understanding of their unique histories, we emphasize caution on how a professional field might represent the group in an objectifying way. And they make assumptions about their needs for counseling. Um, some categorize our categorizations may be experienced as very offensive, become harmful and hurtful to the individuals within, within that group or group as a whole. And so, you know, instead of us kind of being like, let me study you and then tell you about you and what you need, um, more of let the people within an individual group kind of speak on those you know, unique pieces within the culture and the things that you all share but also the things that may be differences and variations, and then um, kind of identify some of the, the things that are important um, parts to be focused on in the healing process. Um, and so again, it, it, the textbook goes on to talk about culture as heritage, and so ways in which um, the viewpoint of like, if any changes are to be made, it's going against a heritage. So culture is ancient, constantly under threat and deserving of preservation instead of recognizing the way that, you know, when we know better, we do better. And so let's make changes where they need to be made because things are not the way that they used to be. And so our culture shouldn't be the way that it used to be if that doesn't fit anymore, if that doesn't work. Um, and so kind of breaking that down. And I know that, you know, when you think about things that are happening in today's society where um, different symbols um, of hate or um, pejorative terms and things like that are used in the name of, of heritage um, and people trying to erase their heritage by saying that those things are hurtful and offensive 
um, or promote negative stereotypes or beliefs about, you know, my unique individual identities, um, it, it's seen as a threat instead of, you know, something, you know, again, something that, that should be honored and celebrated, these, these, these changes to make people feel more welcome, more part of those sort of like in-groups versus the out-groups. Um, next is equating geoculture to nationality. Um, so many efforts have been made to establish political and geogra geographical boundaries on the basis of culture groups and to whip up um, nationalistic fervor around cultural membership. The re result has often been the exclusion of others considered outsiders. And so when you look at, um, you know, in history, Nazi Germany and the assertion of Ar the Aryan culture, um, you know, and, and obviously we know where, where that led to um, the dehumanization and attempted extermination of um, entire groups of people. And so, you know, that is, a concept that is dangerous, obviously, and something that we want to pull away from. Moving away from unidimensional notions of culture groups. So in the early applications of multicultural and counseling, culture was treated as an add-on to the general theories of individual, rather than as a challenge to many individualistic assumptions that have been, been built up in conventional psychology. So today there is more comprehensive and rigorous view of culture and counseling that not only pays attention to the effects of power in the construction of psychological problems, but raises questions about many theoretical concepts in the counseling field. And so, not necessarily like how do we kind of make people fit into these theories from you know decades ago um, that were created and normed based on you know cis hip cis het white men and how do we recognize that those don't fit and we don't have to make them fit we can look into something um, you know different that that works better. And so, um, you know, we're seeking to acknowledge the complex counseling needs and requirements to understand clients' experiences within their own unique cultural negated context that may have in result, in part resulted in their minoritization and marginalization. And so looking from that um, socio-political cultural context um, surrounding clients instead of, you know, the history of, of um, theories to, to place them into boxes. Culture is a production of complex social processes through which, um, you know, different identities are constructed. And it's also um, the representation of these processes that we form in our heads. So we kind of create these narratives um, about them. And so those complex processes make it difficult to identi identify um, unambiguous and non-contradictory themes, despite the best efforts of multicultural scholars. And so empirical studies of cross sections of populations have always been treated um, or should always be treated cautiously in this regard, right? We're not going to be able to answer for everyone. And so we should not assume that we can kind of put blanket theories and stuff on people either. So next we move to culture and postmodernism. And so there's a shift um, to new ways of thinking about culture and responsive response to philosophical shifts um, through the postmodern social theorizing and partly through the development of new academic disciplines of cultural studies. And so that's another reason that this textbook really looks at the different um, fields of study because with new information gathered from them, it can really help our field to advance as well. Um, and so there's a shift to understanding culture as a shared meaning between um, a group of individuals. Um, a culture is a way of interpreting life as much as it is a way of life. And that meanings and interpretations can be slippery, they move about, they're contestable, and they're seldom um, singular or fixed, right? There's lots of different variations. Um, also, the understanding that culture becomes a matter of understanding how people give meaning to things versus just their meaning on them, but how they come to give those things meaning. Um, it suggested that there are three false premises in modern uh, modernist conceptions of culture. It's that um, culture um, cultures are clearly defined delineable holes. That the second false premise is that non-controversial description of the culture of human groups are possible when it's not. And the third false premise is that there exist 
a one-to-one -one correspondence between groups of people and cultural practices, and that political decisions can be made with a degree of certainty about how members of a particular cultural group will respond, when the truth is, is that individuals within that cultural group may respond very differently, depending, you know, their own experiences and the, own, the other um, intersections of their identity. Um, so the modernist version of culture is reductionist because it groups, it reduces groups of people and descriptions to culture, um, of culture to each other without thinking about the problems of grouping them together. What other issues does that end up enabling? And so any definition of cultural membership that you would come up with will leave some people out. It's not going to ever be able to encompass everyone. Um, and being too definite about cultural characteristics has the effect of sidelining anyone who might live on the borders anyway, right? You're just marginalizing them and pushing them out, right? So like they themselves are not defined as marginalized. Someone or something is marginalizing them. Um, culture is not so much a fixed um, orthodoxy as an open field of meanings. It's always emergent, always in process, and always changing. Therefore, fixed accounts of what culture means really is inadequate um, because it's, again, never gonna encompass everything. Cultural groups are noticed to be constantly negotiating ambivalences or tensions among themselves as well as their relation to other groups. And so again, constantly, like as one group is changing, other groups may have to navigate changes as well. And so as the concept of culture itself has become more elusive, it becomes harder and harder to make a straightforward statements about any cultural identity. A particular kind of cultural identity does not mean the same thing it meant a generation ago, or even many generations ago. Cultural descriptions shift beneath our feet as we walk through life. And so how can you continue to focus on those stereotypes and things like that in order to do counseling when they're not gonna fit now and they may even be very outdated anyway? Um, so from this perspective, a culture needs to be first understood as a construction imposed on the lives of a group of people, people by whoever is describing it. Whatever we might say about another person's culture is now viewed as an interpretation, which is much more than a simple description, right? And so it's taking what I'm seeing about a, a specific culture, putting it through my own lens and my own interpretation, and then explaining it. And then you're hearing it through your own lens and perspective. And so it's never going to actually be what individuals within that culture would necessarily consider it to be, if that makes sense. So like even within our own ideas and our own constructions um, of things, there's going to be those individual differences anyway. And so box 2.4 kind of talks about um, what I just said about marginalized groups and using the term minorities to describe people. Um, and there's a shift from the simple noun of minorities to the verbal contract of minor, of minoritized. It suggests that a process that is done to the group of people, they have been marginalized versus putting it on the individual um, group or individual person. And so considering all of this, what the textbook says is that the study of culture is in and itself culture because it's not fully defining the individual culture it's looking to study. It's whoever's lens it is being seen through their understanding of that culture. Um, so cultural studies is relatively new field of studies, um, and it has developed many new postmodern concepts and perspectives on culture. Um, it's also become known as post-colonialism, shifting fields that um, study reflect shifting experience of life and the emergent view of culture and cultural identity as being less solid and more fluid. Um, and so culture and cultural identity are considered less finished products and more as an ongoing process of production. And so um, you'll see that more and more with the different cultural studies, you know, programs and texts and information out there. Um, 
And then it talks about the case for interculturalism, um, which again is, is the focus of this text and, and why when we look at all of these viewpoints and frameworks and all of the difficulties we have with defining this and, and understanding um, culture as a very fluid process and an ongoing process, um, interculturalism is really the best way that we can look at something that, that is changing like that. And so, um, Cultural belonging does not say that that all, um, or excuse me, it does not say all that can be said about an individual person's identity as it moves through time. And so it's not produced out of singular formations, but a series of layers, um, experiences, things that have happened in, in individual people. And so it's a process of convergence um, in which, um, or the ways in which um, the different identity formations converge in an individual person. So again, when we talk about um, intersectionality, it's not about one specific culture and how that plays out, but the way in which all of these different groups that I claim a part of or am put in, in as part of all kind of come together and converge and, and make me sort of the individual person that I am within any of the groups that I may belong to. And so rather than stressing the homogeneity of people, the, post, the postmodern concept of culture has become more pluralistic or um, polyphonic is the, the term that the textbook uses. And so we'd like to emphasize the value of speaking in terms of cultural narratives that run through people's lives rather than thinking of people as being identified in one-to-one -one correspondence with a particular cultural identity. And so rather than um, look at it as the ways in which I fit this, but the ways in which it kind of works through me and, you know, what, what I um, reflect of that culture. Um, so next, after it kind of talks about interculturalism and, and why that seems to be, um, to make more sense, it talks a little bit more about like, it's a narrative arc um, in each of us. And that's why it's so important to touch on this in counseling. The next section does talk about um, this being an option for counseling and the ways in which, um, you know, multicultural has done an excellent job in a number of ways, but interculturality takes us a step further to, um, specifically examine the effects of power relations that are present in all counseling communications in diverse contexts, and also the ones that are in play in the individual client's lives. And so how can we not only be able to recognize and, and know that we need to learn about individuals' cultures, but also look at all of the factors of the power structures and the history and, and all of that that has kind of brought them to the place that they're at right now. They're cultures as a group or themselves as an individual with the convergence of, of their different identities. And so um, the vision of counseling that displays a serious commitment to engaging in cultural differences at the forefront of its practice rests on the belief in some form of social, cultural, or li linguistic justice, which is why, you know, in week two or yeah, week two, we focused on um, becoming agents of social justice change, um, you know, as counselors and the importance of that. And so we will be getting um, into that again and again throughout this semester, hopefully throughout the rest of your program and career. Um, and so counseling practice is not based on addressing these the effects of these power relationships, um, it really doesn't adequately address the complexities of cultural differences, given that they are embedded in hierarchical structures and meanings. And so recognizing that there are gonna be people of certain cultures that are, are privileged and, and hold more levels of power and ones that are, are being marginalized and are not, are not able to hold as much power um, because of the circumstances or the impact of the, the majority groups. Um, so interculturality is a decolonial um, activity. Again, we're gonna get into that a little bit more into the next um, chapter. We talk about the importance of not blurring differences so that an ongoing um, exchange and a learning process from each culture can remain, right? So like, you know, historically people have talked about America as a melting pot and what that really does is melt us all down to the same thing instead of continuing to recognize that there are so many variations and differences and, and we don't have to be the same thing. And so making sure that we're not, you know, negating culture or 
trying to form one solid culture, but being able to, to recognize and celebrate those differences. Um, it, you know, we should also seek to build alliances that sustain, um, sustain us, never mixing or melting, um, and, but really shaping this plur, pluricultural experience and how we respond to one another. Um, counseling is not a politically neutral process and there, you know, has been a challenge and even, you know, admittedly within myself of, you know, how political is it okay for me to be within my profession as a counselor, a supervisor and a counselor educator. But the truth is, is that counseling is not politically neutral. Um, the political environment is not only going to have an impact on our field, it's going to have an impact on us and the clients that we work with. <coughs> And so we can't completely get away from the political realm. And so it is important to recognize that and then make that commitment to social justice um, and change within, within our, political, um, our political world. Um, it's about social inclusion rather than division, right? And so it's not about getting involved in politics to divide us, but to really bring us together. Um, and the aim is to stretch the limits of both the theory and practice that we have in counseling um just to kind of push it to continue to grow and change um at the end of the chapter we have alan e ivy talk about um the response and some additional things um in on page 64 it has a figure of the respectful cube um by michael deandre and judy daniels so you can learn a little bit about that which is the level of cultural um, the level of development in cultural identity, the multicultural issue, and the locus of um, where the responsibility could fall and how those impact each other. Um, and then finally, we have our chapter discussion, which is, you know, focusing on examples of essentialism in our world, um, considering our own experiences of cultural identity, which obviously you did in part one of, um, or you're doing in part one. And then consider others that are close to you and imagine how they might answer that question. And so what are their own experiences of cultural identity? People who are close to you, maybe that hold some of the same identities and some who don't and kind of see the differences. What implications for counseling practice might flow about these ideas of culture? How might Alan Ivey's respectful cube help you to make sense of the complexity of cultural experience? Um, you can do an online search and find instances where culture is talked about um, um, as a reposition or uh, repository of the past rather than a vibrant living force. And so other examples of where it's been seen as a very static, non-changing thing. Um, and do the same for subcultural lifestyles. Um, what concerns do you have or problems do you have with the material in the chapter? There are things that you disagree with or you don't understand or you don't fully grasp the concept of or if you have questions about. And how do other texts that you've read treat these issues of cultural complexity? And so depending on what courses you've taken in the program thus far, how do they address cultural complexity and, and where do they kind of go? And then do you feel like those texts would sort of agree with, align with, or disagree with and just you know, kind of deviate from the stuff that we're learning here. And so some things to think about as you're going through the chapter two this week and um, your discussion post and, um, and moving forward into the semester. So that was a lot for chapter two. Um, hope you stuck in until the end of the video um, or watched it in parts. Um, but I'll be back with the video for chapter three next week. Thanks.